Um, welcome, everybody. Hello. Good afternoon for us here. Uh, as we're just saying, we, we've got uh, Alison isn't quite with us yet, but we hope she will be. Yes, she is. She's just there. Alison is with us. Um, so today we have Kira Thompson, Bridget Griffiths, and Alison McFarlane. And we got Irish lullabies, Welsh songs from A.P. Graves, and Mrs. Joyner from England. So we're very cross border today. I'm glad to say. It's good to see you all. Um, don't forget that our summer time starts before the next meeting. So we in the UK will be going forward one hour. So if you're dining in from elsewhere, you might have to come at a different time. So the next meeting will be on the 3rd of April. Uh, we have Camille Mordu, Julia Lane and Judy Cook giving us papers um, and three very good ones by the looks of things. The following fortnight we won't be meeting, so we only have one in April, 3rd of April, and then the one after that is the 1st of May. Uh, and oh, Okay, everybody happy? We're going to start with Kira. Uh, if you'd like to unmute and um, off you go with the lullabies. All right, perfect. Lovely, thank you. Let me share my screen and all. Um, That's good. Perfect. And actually, I'm going to stop share because I didn't do what Martin told me to do and share sound as well. So we'll try that again. Uh, share sound. Perfect. All right. Okay, we so, have that. You can see that okay? Yes, we can. All right, wonderful. So, uh, hello. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm Dr. Keir Thompson, and I'm really happy to be speaking, you, speaking with you um, about my research. Uh, my presentation is called Rocking the Cradle That Nobody Owns, Personal Expression in Irish Traditional Lullabies. Uh, I know that sounds um, off the bat quite um, a dismal title um, compared to maybe the more blissful images that we might have around lullabies, but um, it'll all be made clear in the coming slides. So, um, there we go. I first want to bring your attention to this quote um, from Dorothy Commons uh, in this book, Lullabies of the World, uh, where she says, uh, lullabies are love songs. Sometimes they are gay, sometimes they are sad, but whatever the mood, they are always tender. Uh, they are the expression of one of the deepest emotions of the human spirit. I find this quote very touching and it seems to uh, drive straight to the heart of what I um, like to explore in my research around these songs. So um, I'm sure that everyone has um, their own idea of what a lullaby is, but just um, to break it down briefly, um, Fenton Valley has defined um, lullaby as a type of song in, which is both a evocation of the singer's love for the child and a means of lulling the child to sleep. Within the context um, of the Irish traditional canon, uh, he also acknowledges their mythological and ideological placement uh, in Ireland by noting the magical, mythical, and otherworldly properties that lullabies were historically believed to possess, including protection from the she or fairies. Um, and this brings in that very strong tradition of um, infant abduction and changing out the healthy baby with a sickly changeling and um, recovery um, of your healthy baby often being an unsuccessful mission. Um, he also notes that uh, lullabies and lulling traditions are present across cultures. Um, Fintan Valley's definition, um, I find is resonant with Brenda Nomadagon's views that lullabies serve not only to pacify, um, but also as supernaturally protective um, in that their vocables specifically, uh, Brenda Nomadagon felt are remnants of ancient protective charms. Uh, Valley notes, um, 
Valerie's notes, excuse me, on lullabies also bring into play the three noble strains of Irish music. And this really grounds that um, the lullaby as a very key element of Irish mythology, being the, um, the gantry, the gold tree, and the sum tree, the um, enchanted music of joy, sorrow, and sleep. Um, now, uh, if we look at the Groves Music Online Dictionary entry on Lullaby by James Porter, we see a detailed mapping of this genre's musical and textual characteristics. Uh, he details, first of all, that the lullabies were originally a female vocal unaccompanied piece. Indeed, in the historical and traditional circumstances, uh, there is very often a strong association between lullabies and femininity and motherhood through the biologically and societally assigned roles um, of childbirth and caregiving. Looking to the present day, while there's still a strong feminine association with the tradition, um, this seems to be opening up into more overtly acknowledging um, instrumental repertoire and um, narratives by an array of voices, not just the female and the mother's voice, looking at the fathers and uh, other caregivers as well, which is very exciting. Um, other distinct features of lullabies noted by Porter include repeated formulae such as melody, refrain, meter, rhythm, and keywords. This repetition uh, speaks both to creating a hypnotic calming atmosphere, as well as the magical capacity of lullabies noted by O'Madgen. Uh, as charms, prayers, and magical words were often repeated a specific number of times to be effective. Uh, Porter notes, the stylized representation of sighing or weeping in melodic and metrical construction of these songs to either express one's feelings or mimic the heightened distress of the child and encourage them to come down to a calmer level. There's also heavy imagery found in lullabies and uh, balladry and storytelling pay, play an important role for both the child and the caregiver. In this vein, lullabies communicate thoughts and emotions in a direct, um, intimate manner. This is compounded through the formalized and yet intense experience of the more private practical context of lullaby singing. And finally, uh, there's also a connection to the body through hypnotic movements by the singer, including rocking, swaying, swinging, clapping, bouncing, tapping your toes, and so on. And um, this is, of course, dependent on whatever cultural context you are experiencing these lullabies in. Now, a uh, frivolous lilt or important facilitator. In seeking out lullabies in my research, I found there to be quite a dearth of representation uh, in earlier written and recorded collections of Irish traditional song, such as that compiled by George Petrie or P.W. Joyce. While they have been included more and more in recent years, they continue to be disproportionately accounted for and even marginalized in comparison to other subgenres. There are several socio-cultural reasons to account for this, including the previously noted points around gender issues. Uh, however, this also has to do with issues of their being diminished and looked down upon uh, based on who traditionally sang and received them. The privatization and social acceptability of the contexts in which lullabies were sung, uh, as well as when, where, and by whom collectors were gathering the songs and considerations of their projected readership. And as well, uh, in this um, bigger you know, uh, paragraph that we have in this image on the right, uh, P.W. Joyce notes that a lot of the collectors in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries would have been looking for instrumental music rather than these vocal traditions. So they sort of slipped through the cracks through those different avenues. Um, to counter these points and make a case for their value and a need for deep inquiry and acknowledgement, I look to Marina Warner, who states that lullabies have been studied very little compared to the ballad. They are despised as sentimental fribbles fit only for mere women and babies. But as I began to explore them, I found that they opened up and disclosed some of the secrets, light and dark, that the most disregarded lives and pursuits often contain. We can also look to Bess Lomax Hawes and her evocative writing. She notes, 
The bill must be paid. If we want independent children, we must trust them away from us. And equally importantly, we must trust ourselves away from them. The American lullaby, I suggest, on one of its deeper levels, is a mother's conversation with herself about separation. And as such, one of its most profoundly supportive functions is to make the inevitable and inexorable payment of our social dues just a little less painful. And I feel that that quote uh, is very emotive and speaks to that um, personal expression. Now, I can't go into detail for the sake of time um, into this image, uh, but I just wanna draw your attention to it very quickly. This is on the right-hand side of the screen. We have um, a scanned image of one of P.W. Joyce's uh, fieldwork manuscripts. Uh, from 1854. And I loved this part of my research, just getting to sift through the old collections and look at the way that they um, transcribed tunes and songs and what they had to say about them. And um, two points that he brings up uh, in this passage that we're continuing to ask these questions today. So I just wanted to include it to show that continuity of inquiry, um, even though he acknowledges that there's a that he doesn't include a lot of lullabies in his work. He um, notes his admiration for them, and um, he acknowledges their beauty and, and um, the beauty of the melodic line, uh, as well as their abundance in use. That he says that they are um, most like he went to see say excuse me they're uh, with great probability as abundant in the north and west of Ireland. So he's really saying they're happening all the time. And um, he feels that they're very effective, you know. So um, he, while he's acknowledging that, he's also saying that it's surprising that if they are so beautiful, so abundant and so effective, why are they not being accounted for in collections and publications? And so I just find it so interesting that he's asking those questions in 1854. And I was asking those questions at the beginning of my research uh, in um, in the you know in the 21st century. So um, very interesting to see that unfold and continue to unfold. So um, from the quotations by Warner and Lomax Hawes on the previous slide, it is safe to say that there's a rich underbelly of thought and emotion being expressed through these songs, and there are more just as much for the singer as they are for the listener. Uh, here we have a few different motivations for lullaby singing that tap into emotional evocation. These are supported by quotes from some of my informants that I have um, interviewed throughout my research. So um, we'll run through a couple of them here. There is, first of all, unconditional love for one's child. Um, Elaine Cormican noted that it was always a positive experience singing to my child. We also have nostalgia and longing, that sweetness or bittersweetness, thinking of one's own childhood, having those uh, cherished memories and that sense of um, parental love, security, and innocence. We have Bird McGilligan saying, um, in reference to the lullaby, I see the moon. Anytime I, look at, anytime I look to the moon, it always makes me think of my mother when I was younger. So I knew if she was out or whatever, that we were looking at the same moon. We also have creating calm over one's worries of their child's well-being. Speaking with uh, Karen Casey, she noted that there's a fear of being a parent. You're afraid your child is going to die. You are, especially when they're really small. And so you're really trying to keep yourself together a lot of the time and them. And then speaking with Noreen Nurian, she noted these stresses of parenthood and that coming through in the lullaby. She said, that relationship will dictate what the lullaby will be. So if they're annoying you, that's bound to be uh, reflected in the lullaby too. And that's okay because that is one way of expressing that relationship. And then if we think back to Bess Lomax Hawes's quote from the previous slide, thinking about that inevitable growth um, of and separation from the child that has to happen and you have to get yourself to process that and cope with that and the lullabies can help you do that. So through these motivations, positive and negative, uh, similar to Dorothy Common's thoughts portrayed at the beginning of this presentation, 
The expression of these emotions through lullaby singing can lead to reassurance, relief, and relaxation. Now, um, I have four examples, and we don't have time <laughs> to go through all four of them. So I've picked uh, one to look at for now. And if we have time in discussion and we want to go back and look at some, uh, we can. But we'll look at Rocking the Cradle that's, um, never, no, that nobody owns for now, um, because this is relating back to the title of the slide. So um, this song, um, the recording that I have of it, I might play it um, depending on time, is of Joe Heaney singing the song. And before he goes into the song, he gives this um, sort of preamble before it. So I wanna read this out to you very quick. He's explaining what the song consists of, where it's coming from. He says, uh, now you're getting onto something now. Of course, uh, I'm sure that there's many men wheeling a pram too, that maybe doesn't own what's inside the pram, you know? At, um, and at the time I'm talking about, there were no prams, there was only cradles. And it's something like the old man with no fulurum. He knew there was somebody else taking a bit out of his cake. And he was left to rock the cradle, you see. And you know, when an old man is rocking the cradle and he's watching the door and his wife is out jumping around, that's an awful dose. Uh, the small fellow in the cradle couldn't care two hoots. He'd be doing the same thing himself when he grows up. So um, I might play this for you now. I am an old man, I'm rocking the cradle. Rock the cradle that nobody owns. I'm here all alone. Rock the cradle. Rock the baby that's never beyond. Oh, so, 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 my baby. Perhaps your own daddy you never will know. I'm here all alone. I'm rocking the cradle. Rocking the cradle that nobody owns. My wife is a flirt. Who married for money? She stays out all night until the cock crows. Take warning, dear Harry, if you ever marry, be sure that the cradle you rock in your own. Oh. Okay, well move swiftly on. It's another round of the chorus after that. Uh, so if we look at a quick analysis of this song, um, picking up on those uh, themes that are coming through. Uh, first of all, this is a more extreme example of that sort of pessimistic outlook coming through. Um, a lot of the songs are quite ambiguous as far as narrator identity um, and are usually a bit more positive. There's that ambivalence sort of running through in a lot of the songs, but they would be much more um, affectionate. So um, just to quickly look at some of the points that we can draw here, there's very minimal vocables um, as well as almost no endearments for the child. And this shows a sort of a reservation and a lack of affection coming through. Uh, if we look back at O'Madigan's thought that the vocables would have been a protective charm that adds that level. If there's a lack of vocables, there's a lack of protection. Um, so just very direct cut and dry, sort of a necessity to lull rather than um, wanting to be there. You know, the narrator declares himself as an old man. Again, we have a very interesting example of looking reflectively at oneself in the lullaby and having that identity be a male narrator. And um, going back to Porter's characteristics and definition of the lullaby, he said that very often it was a female. Um, narrator coming through. So this is a very interesting example to look at in that 
sense. He's also um, reflecting on his circumstances, saying he's alone, he has to rock this cradle, his wife is out partying all night, um, really sort of looking at, at his life in that moment. Um, he states that he's alone. That really emphasizes that sense of isolation and that siloing from the community rather than connection into the community. Um, he doesn't claim paternity of the child. Again, distancing himself from the child, um, being there to care for the child out of sort of a chagrined necessity. I have to care for the child because otherwise their well-being is at risk rather than that sense of unconditional parental love, you know. Um, he portrays the wife's absence, um, precociousness, and opportunism. So um, he's conveying this broken relationship that he has with this wife um, very sort of vividly. And finally, he warns the child um, to learn from his experiences and be wary about the future child's legitimacy, just saying, learn from me, learn from my mistakes, you know, don't fall into my circumstances. Um, overall, we can see very strong feelings of dismay, self-pity, resentment happening in this song. And um, now again, more of an extreme example, a lot of the lullabies in the repertoire would be um, a bit more affectionate than this. But there are very often elements other than just that blissful love coming through. You know, there is a lot of anxiety and fear and frustration coming through as well. So as I said, for the sake of time, we're not gonna look at the other examples that I have. Uh, if we want to go into those in discussion, I'm more than happy to do so. But um, just to say that these elements of um, belief, um, folklore, mythology, these are all coming through very strongly as well. Shaheen Shaho would be a great example, showing the fairies having a party up on the roof or the angels hovering above the cradle. Um, very vivid description there. So I'm just gonna skip through these, excuse me. Um. Now, just to finish up really quick, uh, we can look at the findings coming through. Um, going through this process of analysis and interpreting the traditional lullabies with consideration to their historical, mythological, folkloric, and sociocultural contextualization, several consistent themes arise. There are specific characteristic traits and subfunctions that cause these songs to be effective. They're brimming with emotional expression and evidence of belief that can help the narr narrator explain unknowns, inevitables, and ambiguities around them, as well as acknowledge, process, and accept their thoughts and emotions. There's also the fact that they display a complex matrix of relationships that help situate the singer and the listener within the song themselves, each other, and wider culture, community, and society, fitting those different pieces of identity uh, together. Now, we're just gonna close things off with these three quotations, which I feel um, reflect these findings. And because of the salient relationships that we're seeing arising from these songs, um, articulate their valuable place in Ireland and the Irish traditional canon and more widely express the continuous importance of these songs as intangible cultural artifacts uh, for carers, children, and community. Remembering Marina Warner's quote from the beginning of this presentation, she goes on to say that um, they, being the lullabies, are among the very first utterances direct, directed to babies as persons, and this alone makes them worthy of analysis. My informant, Noreen Lynch, expressed their capacity uh, to house and transmit tradition, saying, I remember being at a workshop Sean Garvey gave in Fecal in County Clare, and it was an Irish workshop, and I went, and people were mad to learn a couple of big songs, and he said after a while, you know, it's the small songs, the children's songs, are just as important as the big ones, because that's actually how the tradition gets passed on, is in your mother singing to you. And he said, you know, the place names in lullabies and the children's song, songs, uh, you should learn all of them, not just the big, strong songs. Finally, another informant, Marin Cowleaf, uh, credited the effective potency of lullabies, saying, the power of these songs cannot be denied. If 
If the only way they are, they are to survive is through performance, I believe it is the response Excuse me. I believe the responsibility will lie with the singer to help convey how the songs would have been used. The most important thing for me is to cherish them and use them. I love sharing them with people, be they my children or a large audience in a concert hall. Now, to that end, my research has found that lullabies are a global cultural phenomenon of a type of functional singing brought into other contextual arenas through the years, such as performance, education, therapy, and more, uh, due to their wide reaching benefits and relevance. They provide a space for sleep, comfort, security, imagination through story and the other world, and a space for self-narration and expression. They also represent, teach, and reinforce Irish traditional culture, values, history, folklore, and relationship norms. That's it for me. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions or discuss anything with you guys further. Um, if we want to go back and look at more lullabies, I'm happy to do so. Uh, I've given my email address there uh, in case anyone would like to get in touch following this. And thank you again. Oh. Thank you, Kiara. Kiara. Sorry, Kiara, not Tara. Thank you very much. Lovely way to start the afternoon. That was excellent. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to raise your hand, you do it by going down to uh, participant note reactions. Click on reactions and you can raise your hand there. Um, we do have a few more few minutes if you want to ask a question. I'm going to ask the first question. Well, I'm going to say two things, really. The first thing is I always say that lullabies are the are work songs. They are, you know, they're far more important than sea shanties and all that other stuff. Um, they are in the right rhythm and, uh, you know, like a, like a shanty. But can I ask you, Kira, it, does it make a difference with the age of the child? Because surely a baby, it doesn't matter the words. The words don't matter um, up to a baby's, you know, what, six months, a year, I don't know. It's the rhythm and the, the tone of voice. The words only start to matter when the child can understand words, or is that not right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that's sort of where I'm coming from, where I feel that the lullabies are just as much for the singer as they would be for the child, as far as that more complex uh, lexical landscape that you have and um, that story that you're creating. If it's a very small infant, that's that sort of story that you're creating is more likely directed towards yourself or the other adults in the room, you know. Um, and then as the child is getting older and older and is able to sort of grasp these concepts a bit more, then you see sort of um, a bit of diluting the water, we can say, um, and seeing more sort of children's repertoire and game songs and like um, things more in that direction, you know. Um, child child created rather than child directed songs. Um, as well, I think that bringing up the language is a really interesting point when you look at the lexical value and cognitive development of lullabies. Um, I think that it's great to have a repetitive, um, you know, set of vocables and it does the job, but if you have a really complex landscape of lex lexical fragments, that is that's being absorbed by the child just as far as trying to understand and build that area of their brain it's a it's a completely different direction than you know song studies but it is so interesting as far as how much the child is gaining from exposure very early exposure to that sort of um language um you know language development they can say so great thank you Kira. we've got to move on because we've got four people queuing up now so keep it short Ladies and gentlemen, Abby, Abby Sale. In, in just that regard, I wonder if you've considered what Rosalie Sorrells calls the hostile baby rocking song, where the parent, where it's all the love is there, the gentle, the, all the functions you've said, but the parent has to get up in two hours and go to work. So some of the, the words fall out of the tree, little baby, and die, things like that, but they're sung, they're crooned. And uh, she, I, I've come across this in South Africa in a number of places. Have you considered those? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I wish that we could 
that we had time to go into uh, more of these songs and really look at them. Uh, that does come through in a lot of the traditional repertoire. Um, you know, there's one Suntri Hudi, um, they call the, the endearment that they use in the lullaby is my unwieldy burden. Um, and so there is this sort of amb ambivalence that does come through and this frustration of, you know, I love you so much, you're my child, but you've been crying for 12 hours and I really need to go to sleep, you know? Um, that absolutely comes through in the songs, um, both in sort of these performative areas as you've mentioned, and also in those traditional repertoire that we've been able to find, so. Thank you, Abby. Uh, Margaret, Margaret Bennett. That was very enjoyable, thank you. I grew up with many lullabies, but Brendan and Mother Gann also worked with Scottish Gaelic um, songs and lullabies. And um, a lot of the lullabies for early childhood, the words do matter, and the child actually, they're not addressed to the child. There's several in Scottish Gaelic which say things like, my curse on Norman that the French let him free from the prison and came back to, to upset us, etc. And then there's a walkable chorus. There's ones where there's a, murders are discussed, where there's heartache discussed, but they all have that rhythm, that gentle rhythm that rocks the baby to sleep. The mother may not sing them to a three-year-old, but to a tiny child, it's her heartache. She's so trapped in these feelings. And the one final point, there's a thesis you maybe like to look at, a comparison between Japanese lullabies, which are very different and don't have that rhythm, by Yusuke Uno and Scottish Gaelic and Scots lullabies, and why there are differences on how the how the, I can send you that it's a very it's online, so you 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 could I'll haste if you want it I'll send it to you. Right, that would be we, fabulous. Yeah. Can we just have one more question from Martin? Martin now. Last question. Right. Sorry. Uh, Yes, um, that was that was most very interesting. Um, I just wondered why you chose that particular uh, song as an example, because you know, from to me it seemed it's rather um, untypical. It, I, I mean, I don't know anything about lullabies, but to me it's not what I would thought think of as being a typical lullaby. I mean, it's a, one of a number of songs on that on that theme of. Uh, uh, of, of the, the man and the baby which isn't his own um, and it was I mean I assume from the fact you call it you're treating it as a lullaby that it must have been a lullaby but uh, I is there a lot of evidence of that <laughs> mm. yeah I mean absolutely yeah I suppose um, part I suppose part of the reason that I chose to look at this lullaby uh, specifically. Uh, out of the four that I had prepared, I wish that I had an hour to talk about these, but um, I chose to really focus on that one. I feel that it, it does a very good job at showing um, a very interesting facet of personal expression that can come through in these songs. Um, and there's a bit of a selfish reason. I just haven't gone into as much detail in that one um throughout my study so it's, it's been interesting to sort of take that avenue and look at another lullaby um for myself as the researcher but um yeah there there's absolutely that sense of well is it is it a song that uh, sort of models a lullaby or is it an actual functioning lullaby um perhaps not um not as much as some other pieces of the lullaby repertoire um, but yes, it has been um, noted as being used in the practical context as well as the performative context. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kira. We, we got to move on, but I'm sure everybody will agree that we could have a part two from you in a few weeks or months time. Um, and we would look forward to hearing so hearing some more of them. Yes, please. Thank you, Kira. We're going to move on now to Rydian Griffiths from Landudno. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> am I pronouncing it wrong? No, Aberystwyth. Aberystwyth. It's Landudno, and I don't live there. <laughs> no, it's Aberystwyth, isn't it? So, uh, yes, that's right. Wales. 
talking about AP Graves. Over to you, Lucia. Thank you. I'll share screen. That's good. Oh, that's not right. Here we are. <laughs> well, um, that's a hard act to follow. Um, this is quite a simple story uh, with nothing like the depth of research that we've heard in Kira's presentation. But it does take us from Ireland to Wales. Now, if the name of AP Graves, Alfred Percival Graves, means anything to anybody, it might be that you recognize him as the father of the poet Robert Graves. Mm. And that's what most people know about AP Graves. But he was quite an interesting character in his own right. Uh, an Irishman born in Dublin of a very strong Anglo-Irish background. His father was a, a cleric who be later became Bishop of Limerick. And he was nurtured in Irish traditions in his youth. Um, the family were very interested in traditional song, traditional customs, whatever, but from a strongly Anglo-Irish perspective. Um, it doesn't appear to me that Graves was much interested in the Irish language, uh, but he was very interested in transmitting Irish traditions and Irish customs and particularly Irish songs uh, to other peoples through the medium of English. Well, he went to Trinity College Dublin but to start a law degree, but he didn't complete it. And then he moved to London and never uh, return to Ireland to live. Uh, in London, he established himself as a writer, particularly of popular verse, and published books of poems, used to write for Punch and uh, magazines like that. And then in 1875, he was appointed an inspector of schools, in which capacity he did some very good work. He established uh, a, a number of local authority, school boards and whatever, and uh, developed a great deal in the curriculum. And one of the things he was interested in was promoting the use of songs in the curriculum. Now in 1882, uh, he published, along with the Irish composer C.V. Stanford, Charles Villa Stanford, Songs of Old Ireland. Now that's Songs of Old Ireland, a collection which drew largely on Petrie for the music, which was arranged by Stanford. The words are not traditional words. Uh, almost in every case, they're composed words, English words by Graves himself. So it's intended very much as a popular collection, not a scholarly collection. And like many of Boozy's national songbooks of the time, it found a place on people's pianos. That was true of the equivalent Songs of Wales, had been published a few years earlier by the Welsh composer Brindy Richards, 1873. Uh, traditional songs, but in very much a concert guise with piano accompaniment for concert and salon performance. And Boozy published a number of such collections. So that's the context in which Graves worked. Uh, Manx National Songs is another one. And there the was a series called the Royal Edition uh, with, one, with Songs of Ireland and Songs of Wales and Songs of Scotland and three volumes of Songs of England, just showing uh, where Boozy's priorities lay. Well, how did Graves get interested in Wales? Well, when he was in London, he chaired the London branch of the Celtic Association. These were people who were interested in all the Celtic countries and their traditions. And Graves as chairman, I suppose, learned something of the other Celtic countries, as well as the Ireland that he was familiar with. And it was partly because of that that he was involved in founding the Folk Song Society, what called itself the Folk Song Society to begin with, 
what became the English Folk Song Society in 1898. But about the same time, uh, he'd started holidaying in Wales because he knew a man called Sir William Priest, who was a pioneer of wireless telegraphy, uh, not as well known as Marconi, but a, an interesting and influential figure. And William Priest was to become later the founding president of the Welsh Folk Song Society. He came originally from Carnarvon in North Wales. William Priest suggested to Graves that he might like to holiday in Harlech on the west coast of Wales. And Graves took up the suggestion, went to Harlech for a few summers and was so enchanted with the place that he persuaded a local farmer to sell him land. And he built a home in Harlech in 1899 called Erinva. He called it Erinva. Erin, of course, uh, Ireland. Erinva in Welsh would be the Irish place. But he used to say, of course, that it, it looked out towards Ireland because it looks out over Cardigan Bay. The house is still there, by the way. It was uh, on sale a few years ago. Now, the other character who comes into the story is John Lloyd Williams, slightly younger than Graves, born in 1854. Lloyd Williams was a lecturer in botany at the University College of North Wales, Bangor, and he was also the director of music there. He was a versatile man. It's an interesting question. If you had a, a quiz about folk song, how many DSCs have been folk song collectors or how many folk song collectors have had DSCs? Because Lloyd Williams was a very distinguished botanist in his own right, but also a pioneer collector of Welsh folk songs. And he established a group of collectors at Bangor uh, who went out into their own area, students who went to their own areas and collected very successfully in the early years of the 20th century. Lloyd Williams was also the founding editor of the Journal of the Welsh Folk Song Society, which he edited from its first number in 1909 until his death in 1945. Well, the two came together. Uh, over the National Songbook, published in 1906, partly to fulfill the wishes of the Board of Education that national songs, as they call them, of folk songs, not necessarily as we would think of them, uh, but many of them were folk songs, that these should be part of the school curriculum. And the National Songbook was edited by Graves' friend Stanford. Well, the Welsh input to the National Songbook came from Graves on the one hand and Lloyd Williams on the other, because Graves wrote English words for most of the Welsh songs in the National Songbook. They also had their Welsh words published with them. And Lloyd Williams did a lot of the selection and revision. This is the note that appears in the preface. Uh, signed by Stanford. The editor wishes to express his thanks to Mr. A.P. Graves for his versions and new translations of many of the songs, to Mr. J. Lloyd Williams, Director of Music at Bangor University College, for the selection, explanation and revision of the Welsh songs and texts. So the two got to know each other uh, over that particular publication. Well, that same year, 1906, saw the foundation of the Welsh Folk Song Society. It was actually founded at a meeting held at the Nationalist Elvod in Carnarvon in 1906, a meeting organised by the London-based Cymrodorion Society, a learned society which still exists, based in London, but interested in all things Welsh. And a very influential society at the time. So they were the people really to get things going and to get people together. And the two people invited to speak at this inaugural meeting were Graves himself and another Irishman, but an Ulsterman, H.R. Reichel. Reichel was the principal of the University College of North Wales in Bangor. So Graves spoke about folk song in general and Reichel spoke about folk song in Wales because he 
had become interested in, in the Welsh songs that he'd heard. There are conflicting accounts of what happened at that meeting because Graves in his autobiography, which he published in 1930, about a year before his death, says that he'd been sent to the meeting by Fuller Maitland, who was the chairman of the Folk Song Society, the English Folk Song Society, to establish a Welsh branch, but that the meeting took a different turn and established an independent society. But Graves's memory may have been playing tricks with him because he'd written to Lloyd Williams before the meeting, suggesting that the meeting could lead to the establishment of a Welsh society, a Welsh folk song society. And that's borne out by what he said in his own address, where uh, the, the two addresses were later published. And he says, well, you may choose to form your own society. That's actually what happened. And Graves uh, was a, a supporter from the beginning and a member of the initial council of the Welsh Folk Song Society. The following year saw the implementation of what had been mooted as a, a significant project arising from the formation of the society, the publication of the first volume of Welsh Melodies. And as you can see, this was edited by Lloyd Williams and Arthur Somerville uh, on the musical side with English words supplied by A.P. Graves. Very much in the boozy tradition, a concert collection, but 16 songs, five of which had not been published before. And that first volume also contains a very good introduction by Lloyd Williams on the characteristics of Welsh folk song. So five songs were newly collected. And in fact, I think this is the first printed appearance of the, the well-known Welsh lullaby, Siogan, which uh, if you were to hear it, you would recognize. I think that's the first time it ever appeared in print. And as you see, to, to bear out the, the, the concert idea, there were two editions, edition A for low or medium voice and edition B for high voice. That was followed two years later by a second volume. The initial plan had been to publish two volumes a year, but that was found to be totally impracticable. And again, the music was edited by Lloyd Williams and Somerville, and the words supplied by Graves. A further 16 songs, some of which had not been published before, some of which had. This time, no two separate editions. That probably cost too much. And again, in the same tradition of a concert collection. But these were intended largely for St. David's Day dinners and functions of that kind, but they were a means of introducing Welsh melodies to a wider audience and some newly collected folk songs. There was to have been a, a third volume, at least, because some of the correspondence from Graves to Lloyd Williams, which is preserved in, in Lloyd Williams's uh, archive, suggests that Boozy was interested in a further collection. There was a proposal to publish one in 1911 to coincide with the investiture of the Prince of Wales uh, at Carnarvon Castle. Nothing came of that. And Graves apparently was forever needling Lloyd Williams about this, saying, well, we must do another collection, we must do another collection. So much so that in 1913, he, he thought that Lloyd Williams had taken umbrage because he wrote to him saying, now do like a good friend answer my last. If you still have nothing to say with Boozy and prefer other writers of English lyrics to your Welsh airs, say so. And I must only join forces with some other Welsh musician, though I should be extremely loath to do so, considering our hitherto happy relations. I don't know whether they fell out. I don't think so, because uh, there's certainly communications from Graves to Lloyd Williams uh, 
in later years, inviting him for a weekend of fishing at uh, Harlech and, and so on and so forth. And I think they still remained on cordial terms. And when Graves died in 1931, Lloyd Williams spoke very warmly of him uh, and, and applauded his enthusiasm and his desire always to get things done. I, th I think the reason there were no more collections was quite simply that Lloyd Williams was too busy. As I said, he was a distinguished scientist. He had his teaching commitments at uh, the college. He was having to edit the Welsh Folk Song Journal, which was a considerable commitment. Uh, in the years that he was editor, he published 500 previously unprinted Welsh folk songs. And these boozy collections were a lot of work. Not only did he have to arrange some of the songs and write piano accompaniments for them, he did some, Somerville did some, but also Graves never mastered Welsh. And so the only way he could produce his English words was to have someone provide a literal translation so, which he could versify. And that was a, a great deal of work. So I rather think that that was the reason that the project never went any further, rather than any falling out between the two of them. Graves, however, didn't lose interest in Wales and Welsh things. In fact, in 1919, just after the First World War, he moved to Erinva in Harlech permanently. Uh, and lived there until his death in 1931. He published a, a couple of collections of Welsh poetry in English, again, based on literal translations. And then three years before he died, he brought out this Celtic songbook. I don't know whether any of you have ever seen this. Um, representative folk songs of the six Celtic nations chosen by Alfred Percival Graves. And you can see the, um, the way it's pitched, lit D, F, R, S, L, author of. Now, statistically, uh, in fact, Wales comes out of it rather well because there are more Welsh songs than there are of the uh, songs of the other nations. 33 Welsh, 30 Irish, 30 Scottish, 30 Breton, 22 Manx and 12 Cornish, <clears throat> excuse me. And of the Welsh songs, every one has Welsh words as well as English. That's not true of the other nations represented. represented. Some have native words with English, some have only English words. So it's a slightly unbalanced collection in, in that way. And Rather significant, I think, is what Folklore magazine said about it in a review in 1929. It is not a selection of words and music such as would be made by a folk song or folklore society. Those who seek the pure milk of the folk song must go elsewhere, and it would not be fair to criticise the volume as if it were intended for students. And that, I think, underlines the context of Graves' involvement in Welsh song and the song world generally, the folk song world generally. Graves was a popularizer, not a collector. He didn't have a scientific approach, as Lloyd Williams had, to the collection of folk songs. He was more concerned with making them popular and if that meant writing new words to them, so be it. So I would suggest that Graves was an enthusiastic supporter of Welsh folk song. He was a great enthusiast he, uh, in Harlech. He was forever arranging pageants to be held in the castle ruins and, and so on. But he was a popularizer, not a scientific collector. So we can't rank him with the collectors of Welsh music or Welsh folk music. Nevertheless, because of his enthusiasm and because he was very good at getting things going, because I think he, he did uh, move 
people to found the Folk Song Society, the Welsh Folk Song Society in 1906. Because of that, he made what I would suggest is a significant indirect contribution to the Welsh Folk Song Movement. Diolchen Vaurichi, thank you. Thank you, Radian. Lovely. Exactly. Yes, there we are. That was really interesting. Can I, can I just point out before someone else does, it was never the English Folk Song Society. Um, the, the English didn't creep in until 1932 with the merger with the, dark, with the English Dance Folk Dance Society, KPSESS. Um, although we often People often do call it the English Folk Song Society to riff, to differentiate it from the others, but it yeah. never had that in the title. Yeah. Um, John, John Baxter has a question. Yeah, you described him at the end as a, as a popularizer, um, but he was publishing to a particular sort of audience and I wanted to sort of draw attention to a different sort of set of popularizers that come from the cheap songbooks that were published around the music halls. So there were collections of Irish folk songs, usually just the words, uh, published for sort of like five or six P, collections of, of Scottish folk songs, again, for five or six P, just, just the words that were clearly designed for, you know, the lower echelons of, of, of society. They weren't sort of posh books by Boozy or whatever. I wondered if there was anything similar in the Welsh context. Sort of penny songbook type things. Uh, yes, yes, th th there are penny songbooks, um, which occasionally contain songs, um, more of what we usually call national songs than folk songs. But, uh, but, but uh, yes, the, the, there are such songbooks. Um, most most of the printed Welsh songs, I think, appeared in songbooks with piano accompaniment, but but the, the, there are a few that have words only. Yes, um, but not not so many because Wales, particularly Welsh speaking Wales, didn't have anything like a music hall tradition, um, but it did have a tradition of penny readings and that, that kind of local entertainment, which is where um, those songs would be sung. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Conrad. That's one mute. Are you there, Conrad? Yeah, Parkinson's. Okay. Uh, song books like Fordyce uh, published uh, Newcastle collections, he's got several, are often used for special purposes. In Newcastle, it's most likely they were used to bring people into the city from the south to develop. And they were sold at the railroad stations and places where people could congregate to influence them. So it's interesting to see what cause might be behind the writing of songbooks of this sort. That's it. Thank you, comrade. Radian, I, I quite like your notion of indirect influence for people like Graves, because I, I struggle with people like Graves who are um, writing new words for the songs and, and, and still calling them folk songs and still, in effect, passing them off as folk songs. Um, but you're right, they did have an influence and it wasn't necessarily negative. Um, because it was drumming up support and getting people talking and getting people interested. Um, so I think indirect influence is, is a good phrase. Were there, were there lots of others or, you know, what's the balance here? How many collectors of, in inverted commas, real songs were they compared to the popularizers in Wales? Oh no, m m most were, were, were real collectors. I mean, John Lloyd Williams himself was very productive in the sense uh, of not only collecting and uh, promoting collection, you know, you get other people to collect. Uh, he also um, published a lot of songs, not only in the journal, but he prepared 
editions of songs for schools um, and uh, uh, others followed his example. Um, I, I, I don't think there was anyone quite like Graves uh, in, 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 in Welsh folk song otherwise. Um, it, part, partly it was to do with the fact of course that the, the, the Welsh folk songs collected were almost entirely in the native language. And so if uh, the, the, the aim was to make them available to people outside Wales who might like to sing them. So you had to provide English words uh, and the English words um, sometimes were reasonable translations, sometimes were only approximations. Um, the, the, the strange thing is that with a few exceptions, I've, I've hardly ever heard anyone sing any of the English words to Welsh folk songs, the uh, ones that are provided in collections. It happens occasionally, but, 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 but not that often. Most people make an attempt to sing the, the, the Welsh words. Great, thank you, Iridium. So we're perfectly on time. We're doing very well, thank you. And we're moving on to Alison. I can't see you on the screen, Alison, but I hope you're still with us. Now, Alison was having trouble during the week with bandwidth, so Martin might need to take over. Are you there, Alison? Right, I think I'm unmuted now. I am here. Ah, there you are, Alison. Thank you. Welcome. We're going to be talking about Mrs. Joyner of Chiswell Green. Over to you. Host disabled participant sharing. I don't know if that's... Uh, you've got to be host. You've got to be made a co-host. Right. Share my, to share my screen. Um, please. Right. Um, Right, we can see that. And I just need to make it. Make it slideshow. Um, that's it, that's good. Right, is that, is that, is that right from your point of view? Yes, that's fine, that's perfect. Because it looks, it looks small to me. Right. No, it looks fine to me. Okay, right. Uh, well, unlike um, the two preceding talks, which were very or well organized and, um, uh, deliberate um, and planned um, presentations. I'm going to talk about um, um, answering question which um, really came about by accident. Um, so I was putting somewhat ironically in the um, abstract um, when the Penguin Book of English Folk Songs came out in, in 1959, my parents gave it to me as a present. I'm not quite sure they weren't involved in the folk world. I'd accidentally uh, been conscripted into the band, Hearts District Band of the English Folk Dance and Song Society, whose um, uh, events are described very amusingly in um, Jane Hawking's autobiography, as she came from St Albans as well. Um, and um, then um, at a later stage, um, when I'd been away to university and come back, um, right, so, so um, when I looked in there, I was intrigued to find there was song which from someone who lived in the same area of, that I, I was living in, um, but of course the, the book didn't tell you anything about her. Um, when, um, moving on to when I'd come back from university, um, I started to frequent St Albans Folk Music Club, where at that point um uh we were interested in um uh, looking at lo um people performing local songs but we couldn't find much um we looked at collected songs um we also followed john foreman's advice to look for local broadsides of which there was more but um if not like um somewhere like hampshire or somerset where 
there are a lot of songs um uh but um uh in order to find out about uh mrs joiner um i attempted various things over the years obviously the first thing was to um look at the songs as they were referenced and published um in the folk song journal and this was the 1960s they weren't online you had to go to the vaughan Lip williams library and uh, look at the journal and photocopy them which meant you had the pleasure of visiting the vaughan williams library which you wouldn't have if you were at home on it um, and um, uh, I, um, over the years um, sorry i really can't see the screen very well um, uh, over the years um, um, this is supplemented by um, in the mid 90s um, looking at Lucy Broadwood's plays at Cecil Sharp House before they had been catalogued by Chris Beam and let alone ended up um, in the full English um, tried to find out more um, f about uh, Mrs Joyner for official records um, using manual me methods um, uh, looking for descendants um, left at local press and then um, in once we got into the uh, 21st century um, it was possible to um, search official records online and find more about them I was lucky with help from other people um, uh, Irene Shettle shared her transcripts from Lucy Broadwood's journals and um, when the second edition of classic English folk songs came out again um, there was Mrs Joyner's version of the trees that grow high um, so I'm going to go through and tell you um, what, what I found and uh, what um, and how the ways of finding out changed over time um, um, the, the songs um, uh, of which the, the one in the um, uh, Penguin book was one uh, or, or, or two um, were published in the Folk Song Society's journal in um, 2015 um, and in th the introduction um, having apologised for the lateness of the journal because the editor was uh, detained by the war in Germany um, uh, Lucy Broadwood expressed her uh, gratitude to Janet Broadwood um, of Bone Hill St Stephen's Heart um, who had um, uh, discovered in Mrs Joyner a distinguished um, excellent singer of uh, traditional songs and had noted the songs um, Mrs Joyner uh, as a widow who does odd jobs in the garden um, learnt a large number of songs from her mother and grandmother who um, were um, were of um, Hart all of Hartford to stock um, all these women uh, uh, were with English descent and um, had, um, had learnt from uh, they, um, Emily Joyner's great grandmother Sarah Hawkins um, and it says that um, she learnt from her mother and her uh, gr grandmother uh, and one of the things one of the few things really said about Mrs Joyner was that um, she um, came from Leverstock Green um, and where her great grandmother and grandmother had come to school and um, uh, that um, that Mrs Joyner had herself studied at one of these establishments and um, where the children had learned from their elders that the straw plaiting trade was a major um, industry in our area in the mid 19th century um, an important part of it was um, the, um, complaints um, of, um, about the straw plaiting 
here it comments that um, the songs she learnt uh, were learnt um, uh, to be, they sang them as they plaited the straw. This was plaiting straw uh, to make, be then further made into hats. Uh, and that it's a domestic industry. Um, sentimentalized sentimentalized uh, a picture of the uh, uh, straw setting in Hertfordshire um, and indeed at St Albans um, it was a cottage industry um, though it was practiced in groups so that is why um, the, there were plaiting schools at which the uh, as well as plat uh, there were questions about the extent to which um, they did the learning and how much they um, uh, did the um, um, uh, 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 plaiting. It said that platters used their thumb and second finger of both hands in plaiting, having um, leaving their forefingers for turning the splat, splints, turn it, setting in and pulling out new straws as a continuous process, giving rhythm motion to the platters. Um, and it was most common in the counties of um, Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire, um, and it um, it peaked in, in the 1860s and then waned again because um, cheap when cheap uh, plat but it was imported from China, so the straw hat making industry continued, but the straw plaiting industry um, declined. Um, it um, it caused great com um, condemnation from local clergy, for example, um, saying uh, uh, that, um, it, that that women uh, were independent, they could earn as much as a farm labourer, horror of horrors, um, and um, that, uh, and even worse, um, uh, um, it, um, that it, it, with its economic independence, and obviously we um, areas which we can see it, um, uh, where there's economic independence, such as Eddington Quarry, where women took in washing rather than working as domestic servants. Um, uh, uh, and even worse, because the middle classes couldn't get domestic servants because uh, women could make more out of straw plaiting. Um, the only... Uh, Broadsheet found of the plat in plaiting industry um, was this one from Luton Museum, and this is about the plat uh, platman who came to buy the ladies' plat, and um, uh, this is uh, suggesting that they were, came for other purposes as well. So uh, beware the uh, married man who bu buys the ladies' plat. These are the songs that were published. Um, in the Folk Song Journal in 1915, um, and a lot of these you'll recognise, a lot of um, um, uh, leading singers sing Mrs Joyner's version, for example, Martin Carthy, um, so that, that um, they have been con uh, continued. The journal mentioned other songs known and a whole list that it wasn't worth um, noting down or publishing because these were um, standard versions and already known. Um, this, obviously, this is uh, um, these are the only collectors to um, not give you their their versions. Um, but where, where exactly was? Um, sorry. Um, Was Chiswell Green? This this is the area between St Albans, Hartford, and Hemel Hempstead in 1890. Hemel Hempstead was here. Leverstock Green, um, where uh, the village associated um, by the um, uh, by the Broadwoods um, was here. St Albans here, and then coming out of St Albans, um, Chiswell Green is too small to be seen on this map. Um, here, blown up. Um, because it was a very small hamlet uh, in the 1890s. Uh, and I'm intrigued 
This is Ragged Hall Lane where I lived. Um, and this is Chisel Green. Uh, There's an area that changed co considerably at the beginning of the 20th century, starting from uh, a small hamlet. Um, so by the late 30s, um, it was surrounded by um, uh, the new suburbia, and this continued further. So, um, um, an aerial map from the mid 90s, you can see more housing development, but um, uh, uh, the hamlet here, which consisted of a, a house, one house, a row of cottages, and Bone Hill, the Broadwoods house which were then with the Rose Gardens, the National Rose Society. So this is looking at uh, Chisel Green in the mid-90s, 1950s shops on the main road, pub which used to be a forge going along the road, a former farm which was then riding stables. On the right-hand side, um, post-war houses. On the left, empty, and you can just see the um, uh, uh, roofs of a row of cottages. And this was um, a row of cottages um, where Mrs. Joyner lived. Um, obviously, by the 1990s, they'd been considerably modernised. Um, um, indoor sanitation. Um, but you can still sign of old privies, um, which has been there since the um, past. Um, this is the occupant of number one. Um, uh, Chisel Green Cottages um, at that point um, uh, and uh, that um, ma um, another interesting woman, May Ivimey, who in her 90s was still a published poet. Um, the, Bro the Broadwoods um, connection with Bone Hill um, um, and this this comes um, some of this from their um, um, from a, a book written about the um, the piano in, industry more that um, he um, uh, Lucy Broadwood's brother who is head of the industry at the time took the lease on Bone Hill in in 1893 and their daughter Janet um, was born at Bone Hill in 1895 um, her sister-in-law. Um, Ada Broadwood became interested in collecting locally. Um, um, Har Harry Broadwood became um, involved in local affairs, um, church warden at the par local parish church, which was between Chisel Green and the centre of St Albans. And he died in 1911, aged 54. Um, the son, Stuart Broadwood, became sub-manager of the family firm but he died in 1926 experimenting in his workshop at Bone Hill and this had significance for the piano um, um, making business as well as um, for the Broadwood presence um, in St Albans. Um, um, right. The, uh, Collecting songs at um, uh, the songs collected in at, at, um, 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 at Lucy um, uh, Liz Chisel Green can be found in um, Lucy Broadwood's papers, um, and of course now on the um, Full English website. Um, in each the the, um, the two singers that they were found. Um, the song uh, words were uh, written down by a family member, and then um, Lucy Broadwood, would, um, on both occasions, came uh, to um, uh, stay for a few days, and um, her diary describes various uh, local ac um, social activities, um, and the, noting down the songs from the singers um, took, was interleaved between things such as. Um, uh, going shopping, going to tea with the vicar, um, and other sort of upper class uh, social activities at the time, um, and um, 
the, the, the um, singer singers they found. Um, this was this was in the late um, eighteen nineties, um, and this was Ada Broadhood would um, noted down songs from two fifteen year old son boys, um, and um, uh, they were their father was a, 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 a ploughman employed by um, a neighbour and uh, Harry Broadwood's fellow church warden. And they, it's, um, the notes on his, this say that they were um, cousins at their age 15 and they were learning the songs um, from one of them's father. You do wonder whether they were being paid, rewarded per song and they're busy going, go, whether they went back to the father to learn more. Um, uh, at, this is entitled Tunes Collected from Fred Page and John Field because um, when I was allowed by um, uh, uh, Malcolm Taylor to go through um, the, the boxes of papers in um, in the Vaughan Williams Library, it was before they were catalogued by Chris Beerman and therefore they were in a mess as um, he said in a letter to me. Um, a notable thing here is that only one of these songs um, was published in the journals and um, I thought the words didn't exist um, until the full English came along and found the, the words beautifully written out presumably by um, Ada Broadwood. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of um, uh, the, the collecting because I want to move on to Emily Joyner. Um, her, her niece Janet, who had been born at um, Chiswell Green, um, uh, noted that um, this um, widow who did who weeded the garden sang. It was possible that she, quite possible that she was singing as she weeded the garden because um, uh, Lucy Broadwood's diary recorded that they after Janet Broadwood had written down the words um, on her visit, they went to um, uh, Mrs Joyner's cottage one day and started um, writing down the tunes. Um, and on a, a following day, um, they um, uh, carried on writing down the tunes while Mrs Joyner continued to weed the garden. So. Uh, um, whether, whether garden weeding was also conducive to singing, um, that would be um, uh, um, an issue. We notice the date 1914. Um, this um, was um, at, at the outbreak of the First World War. So the diary um, is full of um, uh, um, um, observations about the, um, uh, the, the early early days of the war, and they went for a walk and found soldiers camped out in a field, and then there were rumours circulating, like a spy had been arrested arrested in St Albans with a secret plan in a lemon. Um, uh, the actual um, songs is found in um, uh, amongst Lucy Wardle's papers, and if you go into the full English, you will see it. Everything seems to appear twice. It's because I started off with a rough copy, in which um, noted the tunes down, and also notes which are um, what appeared in the journal article. Um, about the origins of the songs and um, uh, but and that's really all the detail that they um, recorded about the singer um, and then there's a second uh, this is a, this is a, um, tunes that they songs that they recorded um, and then a um, revised neat copy um, and uh, this is the song, song where she'd forgotten the words at the beginning. Brian Pearson, um, who uh, was very much behind our interest in um, 
Apart from his songs, was a resident of the St Albans Club and a member of Ewan McCall's critics group. Wondered if finding the posh women coming into her cottage frightened her so much that she forgot the words of a song. But that's not the only reason people. Um, um, and here's a revised copy of two other songs. Um, but so we have the songs, but we don't still don't really have much information about Emily Joyner and um, uh, so in the 1990s I um, tried to find out more both from official records and other sources and um, in the 1990s of course if you were um, doing this sort of family history it was a manual effort uh, um, going to the public search room in St Catherine's house and working back I found um, uh, um, the birth record, birth record of Emily East. Um, she was um, born in Hemel Hempstead Workhouse um, uh, in the Union Workhouse in Hemel Hempstead. Her mother Annie signed with her um, mark which suggests that she couldn't um, write, which is what was said about the um, uh, straw platters. Um, um, and um, um, I also went backwards looking at, um, at uh, her mother and her grandmother and great-grandmother, and you can see that um, her, her gra grandmother, um, Charlotte East, died before she was born, so she couldn't have learnt songs from her. Um, but I realised just when returning to this that I hadn't searched for her great-grandmother, Sarah Hawkins, who might have actually uh, still been alive. Um, but um, her, mother, her mother was, she was born Anne East, her mother was Anne East, and she, in 1851 census, she was living with the family at Leverstock Green. Um, um, of course, 1855, um, she had a daughter, Emily East, um, and the birth certificate, which you obviously could, couldn't read on this, um, said unmarried woman, um, that it was said that um, straw platting women were um, um, particularly prone to having babies out of wedlock, but in fact there was a high rate of, um, they weren't the only people at that time, and they weren't um, the, uh, more likely than other people in the area. Um, but um, having been born um, um, uh, um, in, and given birth in Hemel Workhouse, the previous year, um, Annie's half-sister had uh, had died, and um, um, Anne East then went on to marry her widower. So um, um, the, the couple had um, uh, uh, em Emily from uh, uh, Anne East and three children from a previous relationship, and the, the baptismal records show that, that uh, there was a bulk christening at St Stephen's, the parish church, which looked like that at that time um, and they were living in that parish. Um, now the question of uh, where she was, in 1861 Emily East would have been six, perhaps young enough to start a flatting school um, and until um, the census went online I couldn't find her because um, uh, what you did you went to the Hertfordshire archives and looked at the, um, uh, the, the microfiches of um, the Hertfordshire census and she had, at least on census night, possibly for longer, she had slipped over the border into Buckinghamshire uh, between Berkhamsted and Chesham and was, um, was at least on census night um, with her um, half-sister um, while her mother was at Park Street, um, which was to the south of St Albans, um, with various others of the family. 
um, of course, the census is only happen every 10 years, so whether she spent time with Leverstock Green at the Platting School, with the her half sister, which I think who I think is a floor platter, um, brought her up, we don't know. Um, and by 1871, um, they were all at Chiswell Green, in at Chiswell Green cottages. Um, uh, in 1873, um, when uh, Emily was 18, she gave birth to her son, William, at, um, at Chisel Green. Um, and then a year later, she got married. So this is, this is following the pattern of her mother, um, having a child and then getting married. And um, in the f following years, um, the... She met Mary, Jane, met Mary James Joyner. The couple and their son um, again were out of the county at um, Hendon. And again, you need a national database to find that. Um, and then they moved back to Chisel Green. And you can see, see this, um, uh, the size of it, but it shows that, that at these Chisel Green cottages, um, there was some. Um, uh, James Joyner, agricultural labourer, and their son, um, um, uh, William Howe, um, whose name change has gone back to that Howe, was an agricultural labourer. By 1901, he'd got married and moved uh, to, to Bushy, where he was described as a railway labourer. So this is her son had one one son had moved away as um, part of the general movement to the towns that happened in the um, eight, um, eight, uh, eight, 1890s. Uh, one of the things I tried to do was um, find um, descendants to see if there was anyone doing family history in the opposite direction. Um, but as you see, her 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 son died at at um, fifty four, age of fifty four, and her grandson uh, um, uh, died in twenties of his T of TB. Um, I have to say, automatic searching in the nineteen oh one census, they didn't really reveal where they were. But as they'd had the first two children christened at St Steve Stephen's. Um, in St Albans, where their grandmother lived, um, it gave their address in the parish register, and I was able to find them in Bushy. So, uh, the 1911 census found uh, four um, uh, children, but I wasn't able to chase them. And now I felt enough that enough information about her to write a letter to the local press. Um, uh, see if anyone remembered her and I was lucky somebody had um, uh, some uh, two sisters who had grown up in the same line of cottages and uh, uh, later they moved uh, down uh, the, down the road um, to a new bungalow but they kept um, in touch with her and um, her mother looked after them when she got old she lived at number six of cottages, and Aunt Em, as we called her, lives at number one. Um, and she shared her memories with her. Um, there were six cottages in the row, and Aunt Em lived nearest the road. She had no electricity, water, or indoor sanitation. There was a communal wash house at the end nearest the road. Women were always women in the cottages were always singing when the wash house, um, um, especially when washing. But the two sisters couldn't remember the songs, or didn't learn them, or they moved away too young. Um, uh, Aunt Em would have sung while working in the Broadwoods garden at, Mon at Bone Hill. There was no social mixing, so Janet Broadwood was in, wouldn't have known the other women unless they worked for the Broadwoods. She was the oldest of the women in the cottages. She always dressed in black, black with a black bonnet. She cooked in the old way with a pot. Unlike the others, she was apparently had no family, as no one visited, but she acted as everyone's grandmother. She had a log lodger as Alf Gibbs, and no one was allowed to say it was anything else. She had a role in the Hamlet. She had a, her role in the Hamlet. 
Um, she acted as a midwife, although unqualified. As children, they couldn't um, understand where Aunt Em got the babies from. She was also a healer, had various remedies, usually tasting horrible, and they usually tried these before the expense of um, getting a doctor from St Albans, and she also laid out the dead. So she had this um, uh, role um, uh, common in the 19th century of being traditional healer, midwife, and layer out of the dead. And this, these were skills that were passed on, um, uh, for particularly women in the community. Um, uh, and so um, we could see other accounts, accounts from elsewhere, like um, a, a local example, Edwin Gray's Cottage and Ash in Hartford Village. And these, um, they had um, uh, high levels of skill, well, Though they always represent, there was a representation of Mrs. Gamp, the drunken midwife, but many of these country women had skills which were traditionally passed on. But um, um, here is the fireplace as it was actually in the 1990s. It was still black, and you could still see the hook that she had um, cooked from. Um, as far as um, being uh, women who carried on with, after the Midwives Act without being qualified, um, she had to produce, if you, after the Midwives Act came in in 1902, if you pr um, produced evidence that you were skilled in midwifery, you were allowed to carry on, and the Midwife Register had a particular list for um, of bona f these bona fide midwives. But these two sisters saw her practicing midwifery in the 1930s when there weren't many midwives left and she was never actually on the midwives register. So there she was carrying this uh, traditional role um, in this tiny hamlet but surrounded by suburbia. Um, looking, trying to um, look forward um, um, towards the end of her life um, we can see the uh, loader they found in the 30s was um, already there. Well, he was actually there. Um, he was there when her husband was uh, still alive in 1901 and um, uh, continued to, um, uh, and was still there in the 1930s. So it was a very long standing loader um, in, in what we would now consider quite a small cottage. But of course, people had less space in those days. Um, uh, uh, the sisters said that um, mo their mother looked after Aunt Em at the end of her life. She had a dread of hospital. As it, of course, it was the uh, workhouse infirmary, the poor house, and she'd been born in the workhouse. Um, they thought that she had actually gone to hospital, um, but um, uh, her, de her death certificate said she died at home from a stroke. Um, though they felt she hadn't got any family, um, the death certificate said that a niece from Neverstock Green, so none of her family in Bushy, but the niece from Neverstock Green uh, was present at the death. Um, finally, um, I looked into this in the um, 1990s. Um, in 2014, we uh, did a concert of Hertfordshire songs, partly marking um, a centenary since the collection. Um, and I took photos again. Whereas in, whereas in um, uh, the 1990s, Bone Hill was the headquarters of the National Rose Society. Um, they put up a marquee in the summer, and uh, it was a great wedding venue. Most local Cayley bands had played there. But um, the National Rose Society, um, obviously, um, uh, financial difficulties, and so it's no entry, and there's no roses either. The cottages had also changed by 2014. Um, the line of former pretties had gone. The fireplace uh, was painted white so that you couldn't see that anybody had um, uh, cooked there with a the pot. Um, and so it's, there was less evidence of what 
life had been like there by 2014. Alison, we're going to have to wind up soon. If you could just, slide. just finish up. <laughs> right. Um, uh, um, the question, of course, we said we should have done this ages ago. If we'd started in the 1960s, Janet Broder was still alive. Um, and um, we, we, it wasn't possible to find that there was uh, either about the transmission of songs or midwifery skills. Um, in fact, um, as I'd shown on the previous slide, um, her, Emily's mother live, was living next door to her in 1911 and she, uh, died next door um, in, um, uh, in the 1920s. Um, we still don't know why there was so little collecting um, in Hertfordshire. The collection of these two singers was um, fortuitous um, from the point of view that um, uh, the Broadwoods uh, lived in Hertfordshire and um, the, uh, other members of the family got interested. Uh, there's also the co questions about the concept of county songs. Um, so a few songs were collected in Hertfordshire by um, Lucy Broadwood and appear in her county songs, um, but under the, count the counties of birth of the singer, not where they were living. And then we've already heard this before, but you know, what are work songs? Um, um, and the whole question of which some of you have written at great length, so uh, um, I'll finish there. The, the uh, relationship between singing and women's social and, and uh, economic position, because we can see that um, em Emily Joyner, or was it Howe, or was it East, um, was clearly an autonomous woman. Woman, she um, she uh, was a straw platter. She um, had had the, had the role of um, traditional healer, and that. Um, by the end, she was weeding the Broadwoods garden and um, rather than um, working in their house. So, uh, so that is slightly uh, trash enough to take this on when Steve was desperate for someone to fill a slot. I wasn't quite, I didn't, I seem to have um, been unaware that the, my slides would look so small to me. So that's. That, that, so that's it. I ended with questions because we found things out, but there are questions which clearly we didn't answer. Thank you very much, Alison. That was that was excellent. And the the slides on my screen are perfectly all right. I can read them even with Good. my eyesight. That was wonderful. Thank you. And it was very interesting to learn more about one particular singer because often we we take the broad view all the time and. Uh, it's nice to be brought back down to the individual person. We don't have time for questions. I'm sorry, but we've got to finish. Uh, thank you very much for our three speakers today. It's been a particularly interesting session and very, very varied in topic and style. So thank you for uh, coming, everybody. Next meeting is the 3rd of April. Um, we've got another three. Uh, very interesting talk. So I hope we'll see you all then. Thank you again for coming. Goodbye, everybody. Fare thee well.